As new details emerge in the killing of Trayvon Martin, the FBI is out in force publicly investigating the incident. At least four agents in clearly marked FBI shirts went door to door at the scene today, apparently looking for potential witnesses. A bureau official confirmed to NBC News that agents from the Tampa field office had begun their parallel investigation into the case, specifically focusing on whether Trayvon Martin's civil rights were violated when he was shot to death by George Zimmerman. The official said agents are seeking information on Zimmerman's background and whether he was racially motivated when he pursued Trayvon Martin. And we now have a fire department audio from the night of the shooting canceling an ambulance that was en route to the scene for George Zimmerman, referred to in the audio as the second patient. In the audio obtained by the New York Daily News, you can hear dispatchers saying a second ambulance was not needed to go to the scene. And as you can hear rescue workers asking, they are also asking for a medical helicopter for Trayvon Martin. Contact air care and uh, have some things We are Lane Lines Air Care checking the weather. Air care, we are not available due to the weather. And in what could be one of the most important developments in the case, two forensic voice identification experts say the cry for help on the 911 call on the night of the shooting was not the voice of George Zimmerman. Joining me now are Tom Owen, forensics expert and chairman emeritus of the American Board of Recorded Evidence, and Ed Primo, an audio engineer and forensics expert. Uh, first, Tom, to you. Uh, tell me what you established and how you established it uh, with these audio tapes. Uh, well, Lawrence, I uh, attempted to do a comparison of a, a known voice uh, being a Zimmerman and an unknown voice being the person who was screaming. And uh, I manipulated the tapes in such a way where I took out everyone else, in other words, the 911 controller, the uh, background noise, anybody else, uh, or any other noises other than the, uh, the voice itself. And then I compared the two together in a biometric program uh, called Easy Voice biometrics and that was able to discriminate uh, the difference between the two and come to a conclusion uh, of whether it was or it was not uh, Zimmerman. And the only thing you could uh, achieve here, Tom, is whether or not it was yes. Zimmerman. You don't have a way of determining uh, whether it was Trayvon Martin. That's correct. There was, I had no uh, 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 samples of Trayvon Martin's voice to compare against. You need to compare audio to audio. Ed Primo, uh, what method did you use to reach the same conclusion? I listened to the 911 recordings, Lawrence, and I used critical listening skills that I've developed over the last uh, 28 years of my career. And I hear completely different sounding voice tone. Uh, a voice is like a symphony. And based on my experience, I used my critical listening skills to determine uh, what I've already declared. So, Ed, you're using kind of an old-fashioned piano tuner's method. You're just, it's the human ear, uh, highly tuned and highly trained to, for these distinctions. Uh, Tom, uh, the, the tests that you've run, would they be admissible in court? Yes, I've already testified uh, and admitted this software and this methodology in the State versus Davalu in Connecticut, a murder trial involving a 911 call. And, uh, and, and Ed, uh, what is your level of satisfaction uh, with your finding? Are you 99% certain or are you 70% certain? I'm in the 90s, Lawrence. I, I would love to have an exact exemplar of Mr. Zimmerman's voice to be able to compare to those screams and I could come up with some scientific evidence to prove uh, whether it is or is not his voice at that point. And let me go to the other uh, controversial element of the tape of uh, what Zimmerman's own 911 call, uh, where he uh, uses potentially a racial slur. Some people hear it, some people don't. Uh, Ed, first you, uh, what do you believe he said? Lawrence, I'm hearing, uh, I'm hearing it pretty clear. I've listened to it and I've walked away from it and I've went back and listened to it again. And I'm not comfortable repeating what I'm hearing, but it's right. got to it, do it, with it the F-bomb. 
Yeah, it is that racial slur effing and then the uh, racial slur for, for black people. Uh, Tom Owen, on that point, do you have a finding on what he's saying at that point? No, I was not asked to make any finding at that, but uh, I will attempt to do that, and that'll be uh, uh, that'll come out in the near future. Uh, okay, and uh, and just to clarify, uh, to going forward, uh, would it be helpful to you to have a tape of uh, Trayvon Martin's voice, and what kind of tape uh, would work? Uh, would a voicemail or something like that be uh, usable so that you could try to use your systems for uh, determining whether that's his voice that we're hearing uh, crying for help? Yes, in any cases like this. I'm sorry. In cases like this, Lawrence, it's okay. In cases like this, I would love to be able to review as much family archive video footage as possible and find a section of Trayvon's voice in an elevated mood, like playing a video game perhaps, or, or being at a party in, in a high spirit or laughing or yelling across the room because that's the type of energy that's behind the voice that's very fearful on that call and calling for help. Uh, Tom, uh, quickly before we go, if this case goes to trial, would you expect the defense to hire their own audio expert to make a counter case about what's on that audio tape? Well, I think both sides are going to hire their own experts. All right. Thank you very much for joining me tonight. Ed Primo and Tom Owen, audio experts who've listened to those tapes. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lawrence. Joining me now is Charles Blow, editorial writer for The New York Times. Uh, Charles, this is the thing we've been wondering f uh, from the start. Uh, it, it, I think all of us listening to the screaming on the 911 tape, uh, screaming for help, uh, just in our experience, it sounds like a younger voice. Uh, it sounds somewhat possibly higher pitched, you know, the, than an adult male's voice would be. Uh, but uh, fix for us in the elements uh, of, of the story as we know it now, how important it is if we really do have a finding to a 99% certainty that that is not George Zimmerman's voice crying for help on that tape. Well, here, here are the things that, that are important for me. Uh, as an observer to find out about those tapes. Whether or not there could be two people at any point during that 911 call, because it goes on for quite a while. And you can imagine a circumstance under which somebody could yell for help to help subdue someone while someone else yells for help to get this guy off of me or whatever. So that, that, is, all, that is important. The other thing it, to, uh, to remember, Lawrence, is when I interviewed Trayvon's mother and grandmother, they indicated to me that they do not have a single video of Trayvon Martin. I asked if she had any voicemail messages of him saved on her phone. She said she had none. And the only uh, voice that she could rec uh, recall or think that there may be of his is of his voicemail message. If you call his phone, he doesn't pick up and, he, and the, the answer machine picks up. So you may not be able to get a, a piece of video from Trayvon Martin in an elevated kind of a, a state of, of speaking. So that may be a handicap here in this case. So the first thing is, can you eliminate uh, George Zimmerman altogether? Second is, is there enough of Trayvon's voice left in the world that you can get a match? from Trayvon's voice. But if you get that, that does go one step further in the family's defense, uh, that Trayvon is a person who is fear, fears for him life, fears for his life, maybe being attacked. That doesn't answer all the question, but it goes a step further in that direction. Charles M. Blow, thank you very much for joining us tonight. Coming up, Trayvon Martin's mother and father and the city manager of Sanford, Florida will join me with more on the killing of Trayvon Martin. And in tonight's rewrite, Mitt Romney was asked today if he thinks it's a sin for a white man to marry and have a child with a black woman, which for a Mormon turns out to be a more complicated question than you might think. And later, 
An explosive device goes off at a Planned Parenthood clinic in Wisconsin, but that doesn't stop Rick Santorum from attacking Planned Parenthood in Wisconsin today. Howard Dean and Steve Schmidt will join me to discuss a new poll of swing states that shows just how much the politics of contraception is helping President Obama's reelection campaign.